Go ahead and turn to. We're going to be we're going to be jumping around a little bit, uh, but turn to Genesis chapter eighteen. Genesis and chapter number eighteen. And we'll be there in just a minute. I'm continuing a, kind of a uh, a thought that uh, I, I began on Wednesday night uh, when we were looking at Jacob and the fact that he comes before Pharaoh and he says to Pharaoh, you know, I'm 130 and few and evil of the days of my life. Man. Yes, say Genesis 1. And we were looking at the years of the people before Jacob and how long they were living and things of that, that nature. 18. 18. Um, uh, we, were, we were looking at those things and, and I, I, I'm trying to break it down and make it simpler for us to understand. And that's why this morning in Sunday school I was talking about, number one, personal personal sins, number two, uh, family sins, number three, well, we, we talked about city level sins, number four, we talked about national sins, and number five, we'll call that the sins of humanity, basically just people in general, the world, mm -hmm. okay, and those will be the five levels that I've, I've found in my study of the Bible that God, he's, he sees all of it, he sees every level of it. I can't look at a city and go, wow, I can tell where that city's sin meter is at, you know. But uh, when he's talking to Abraham and he says, the cup of the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, I want you to understand what God is doing there. He, okay, he, is there literally a cup? No. But he's comparing it to that to give us a visual. He's saying, there's this nation called the Amorites, and they have this cup of iniquity, and it's not full yet. So in other words, God is watching it fill up. He's paying attention to it. He, had, he knows how big the cup is. <laughs> he, know, he, he, he views it all. We don't see any of it, right? And this is why, you know, when his disciples, uh, when Jesus' disciples walk up, they, they walk up to the lame man who had been lame from birth. And they asked Jesus, he said, well, did he sin or did his family, did his parents sin that caused this? And Jesus said, neither. Because we're not, we, we don't know those things. You know, we, we don't. God sees all of it. Uh, the reason he's lame is because sin is in this world in general. So you really could say the sins of humanity have caused that. We live in a sin, sin curse. Well, does a baby sin and that's why a baby dies when it's only two months old? No. We live in a sin cursed world. Right. You can chalk that up to the sins of humanity. You can chalk that up. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. That's where that started. So, so is sin the, the reason for death? Absolutely. But is it always a personal level sin? No. No. Sometimes it, a person is drinking and driving and they, they have a wreck and they kill the other people in the, in the car. Was that their fault? No. It would be the driver's fault. The, the drunk driver's fault. Absolutely. But was it that, that family who, who passed away? Did they sin? That, uh, no. Not necessarily. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm getting at? Now we're all going to, if the Lord tarries is coming, we are all going to face death one day. Why? Because of sin. Just generally speaking, just because of sin. I was born with a sinful body. I was born in a sin-cursed body. The ground was cursed for our sake. Adam and Eve were made from the ground. I mean, all of this, it just adds up. And so there's sins on a personal level. Uh, there's sins on a family level. There's sins on a city-wide level. You think of cities like Sodom and Gomorrah. Did God judge Sodom and Gomorrah? Absolutely. It was a city-wide level. How about the city of Nineveh? Did God call Jonah? The whole book of Jonah is about the repentance. That God is trying to get an entire city to repent. It's the whole point of, of the book of, of Jonah. And Jonah doesn't want it to happen. <laughs> uh, Jonah can't stand that city. And, and so you've got city-level uh, uh, sins. You've got national sins. You've got the sins of humanity. Uh, what, can we, what can we do about it? Well, first of all, I want to start off with the family. I want to start off with the family. Look, at, look here at Genesis chapter number 18 and verses number 17 through 19. Look at this with me, if you would. It says, And the Lord said to Abraham, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. You see that? One man is going to become a nation. All the nations of the earth are going to be blessed from that one nation. 
Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So even though it works one way, you know, the sins of a nation, you know, the sins of this, the sins of... It also works with, here's a blessing of a nation, we'll bless all the other nations. It works the other way too. Isn't that great? I, I, I'm, it's, it's profound how the Lord works this out. But it says in verse number 19, he says, For I know Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And so there's this blessing on Abraham's family because of Abraham. There's a family-wide blessing because of him. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, I thought of the verse uh, in Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, to the very famous, it's probably the only verse that any of us know from chapter 24, uh, you know, by heart. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What's Joshua saying right there? I'm speaking for my family. You make, you make up your mind for your family, but as for me and my family, yeah. we're serving the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so you've got, this, you've got this decision for a whole family there. And you, you find that at the end of Joshua chapter uh, 24, verse 15. How about citywide? You think, right here, we're in Genesis chapter 18, and what God is talking to him about uh, is, hey, I'm about to go judge Sodom and Gomorrah. You find that in verse 20. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. I want you to think about that. Jesus is saying, their sin cries out to me. I can't help but hear it. You, you think about when Cain killed Abel. Now, that's personal. That's very personal. You think about when Cain killed Abel. What did, what did God tell Cain? Your brother's blood cries out from the earth. I hear it. I can't help but hear it. It's, it God knows all of it. He, he hears all of it. It's crying. It's crying. Please judge this. Please avenge this. God is the great judge and avenger. That's what he is. Vengeance is his, saith the Lord. Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. And this is one of my favorite passages. This is one of the great intercession passages where, where Abraham starts going, well, if you find 50 righteous, mm -hmm. would you spare the city for 50 sick? And, and God said, yeah, if I find 50, how about 45? And I got 50, do I hear 45? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I wish I was fast enough to do that, but I'm not. Uh, I got 45, do I hear 40? <laughs> and, and, and then it goes on down to 30, and then 20. If you find 20 righteous, would you spare it for 20? Say, how about 10? I'll, I'll, I'll stop right there, but how about if you find 10 righteous? It is very telling that God could not even find 10 righteous in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And there's a whole bunch to be said about that. But God said, yeah, if I find ten, if I find ten, I'll spare the city. He found Lot. He found Lot's wife. And he found his two daughters. Personally, I think you can make a, uh, uh, I mean, it's hard to tell of those four which ones were righteous. I believe the Bible is very clear that Lot was a righteous man. It says that. It says that. But it doesn't say about his wife. And it doesn't say about his two daughters. I know they got out of the city. I sure hope they were saved. Because you don't find any evidence of it. You can be saved with no evidence, I believe. But it's going to shorten your life and, and things of that. There's things that go along with it. But it sounds like there were either somewhere between one and four righteous in the city. Isn't that very telling? And so judgment came on a whole city because of the lack of righteousness in that city. And so, you have the, you have, you have the city of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. How about, I mentioned this, the city of Nineveh. God was going to judge that whole city. And the Bible says Jonah went preaching them. And I, 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 Jonah hated those people, but he was more afraid of God <laughs> by that time. I mean, you get swallowed by a whale and see if that changes your mind about things. But he couldn't stand those people and he did not want them to be forgiven of their sins. He pointed that out. He said, God, you're a God of forgiveness. I knew you'd forgive them. And I didn't want them to forgive him. You say, well, that's really judgmental. Jonah, well, the Assyrians were known to skin people alive. All right? They were known to do some awful things. And Jonah had seen them do awful things. He had seen them kidnap women and children. He had seen, he had seen things... Uh, happened in Israel that were awful things and he hated those people which was not God that wasn't and God said look I'm either going to take you out or you're going to do what I told you to do 
And Jonah finally went and preached. It says a whole city got saved. Yeah. Praise the Lord! Jonah's not praising the Lord. He goes and sits and, and pouts about the whole thing. But a whole city got saved. It's probably the best revival in the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. We're looking at hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, we get excited about the 3,000 that get saved in the book of Acts, right? When Peter stands up and preaches, 3,000 people get saved. We're all, I mean, I'm, I'm excited. I don't know about you, but that's awesome. Yeah. A whole city? Nineveh. That wicked city. I mean, we're looking at hundreds of thousands of people get saved. Praise the Lord. If you're saved today, you're going to meet Ninevites in heaven. And they were probably pretty wicked. But they got forgiven of their sins. Amen. And that's what counts on a personal level. They got forgiveness of their sins. See, I can't be saved for my city. Paul said, I, I, would, like to be for, I would like to be saved for Israel, but I can't. Uh, we wrestle with that, don't we? I, I, what parent, what godly Christian parent wouldn't go, oh, I'd be saved for my children if I could? Oh, yeah. What parent wouldn't give their life for their kids? Lots of parents would, right? The majority of parents would, yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd give my life for my children. But we can't, can we? We can't be saved for our children. We get saved on a personal level. For our personal sins, we get personal forgiveness. Personal forgiveness. But there's the sins of a city. There's the sins of a nation. Turn over to Daniel in chapter number 9. I want to share this passage with you. Daniel in chapter number 9. Beginning with verse number 1. Now you think about the book of Daniel. What's going on in the book of Daniel? Well, the sins of Israel, the nation... Did Daniel personally sin to go into slavery in Babylon? No. No, but it rains on the just and the unjust. And so Daniel finds himself in Babylon for his whole life. His entire life. Basically from when he's a teenager. Because they spend 70 years there. I think he's in his 80s when they finally get to go back. That's your entire life, Daniel. How would you like that? You're a teenager. America gets conquered tomorrow. And you become a slave for the rest of your life. But in your 80s, you figure it out. I'm just teasing. I don't want that to happen to you. I'm just saying. That's what happened to this day. Mm -hmm. And in verse number 1, look at this. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years. And so it's dawning on him. It's going to be 70 years. He was studying the book of Jeremiah. It says, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? Daniel was studying his Bible. It says in verse number 3, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love Him and to them that keep His commandments. Look at this. What, verse, what does verse number 5 say? We have sinned. National sin. He's praying for the sins of his nation. He's confessing the sins of his nation. That's what he's doing. saying Israel has sinned. And here's why we're in the predicament we're in. And have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Ne Look at verse number 6. This is, he says, Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets. You sent preachers to us. You sent prophets to warn us. We would not hear them. Which spake in thy name to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Daniel's very realistic, isn't he? And he's not, this isn't necessarily on a personal level, but he's recognizing that this, is, this encompasses him. He's in the middle of this. You know, personally, I don't think I've been that bad of an American. I mean, I've, I've done some bad things, but I don't think I've been that bad of an American, right? But I'm still in the midst of a nation of sinners. Mm -hmm. And I'm still a sinner myself. But I think, I think there's plenty of things that can come upon me and my family because of the sins of our nation. Plenty of things. And that bothers me a lot. That's why we preach against it. That's why we try to warn people about it. That's why we try to get people in general to turn to the Lord and, and get forgiveness of their sins. 
Think about the sins of humanity or the world. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's everybody, Daniel. That's Brazilians. Mm -hmm. That's people in the Congo. What would you call them? Congoans? Congolians? Uh, the, uh, Mongolians. That's Chinese people. That's Japanese people. That's German people. As wicked as they were there for a little while. That's German people. That's, that's Americans. That's Native Americans. That's African Americans. That's Irish Americans. That's, that's the Irish. That's English. That's everybody. The whole world. Jesus Christ, He came for them. The sins of humanity. It's, it's amazing because the first sin of humanity you find is Adam and Eve. And you find Paul making that comparison in the book of Romans. He's saying the first Adam. Well, the second Adam. Jesus is the second Adam. In the first Adam, all men die. Because he sinned. In the second Adam, all men may live. You think about that. God sent Jesus to provide the cure, to provide the answer for all that for all of humanity if they would receive him. That's it. Isn't that amazing? God is, is looking at all of the sins of humanity. Was he not doing that in Noah's day when he said, hey, I'm going to flood the whole earth? Is he not going to do that again one day when the Antichrist comes on the scene and he's like, look, you didn't want Jesus. You didn't want anything to do with him. How about you take the opposite of him? And let him rule the world for a little while. And let's see how that goes. And then when he comes, comes to Israel and he, he presents himself to them at Armageddon. And, and they, they re, it says the whole nation of Israel. That, what's left of them? <laughs> I, I think if, if I understand it correctly, I think there's going to be about a third of the nation left at the end of the tribulation. They're all going to receive their Messiah. It's as if, it's as if you know, the Bible's saying they rejected him at first. And then Israel will receive their Messiah. And he will begin his thousand year reign on this earth. And oh, what a beginning that will be. What a beginning. I, I personally believe people are going to be uh, living to be in their 900s again during that time. I think it's going to be such a wonderful time. Awesome time. Uh, of prosperity on the, on the earth. But the sins of humanity. God has paid the price if they'll just receive it. Which brings us to a personal level. What can I do? I, th I think about, I think about all my personal sins. I think about the sins, you know, family sins. My mom had some uncles. They brought some curses into our life. They robbed a bank. I never met them. I don't know. My mom had three uncles that decided to rob a bank. I am certain that brought some trouble in our family. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, it's your fault. No. <laughs> I'm certain that probably brought some family problems. And there's no way around that. If, yeah, Brother Richard too. <laughs> I knew it when he when I looked at him. I bet you he's got some family. Right? Your grandpa. <laughs> Everybody has that family member. <laughs> uh, you know, and so we've all got the, you know we've got family sin. We've got things that you know family members have done in our past, and and there's things like that. There's city wise. What can we what what can we do on a personal level? The answer is Jesus Christ. You can, start with, you can start on a personal level. The answer is Jesus Christ. The answer is receiving the Lord. The answer is receiving forgiveness of your sins. That's where it starts, right? Amen? Amen. Because I can't answer for everybody else. I, I, I can't get saved for everybody in Idaho. I can't get saved for everybody in the United States. I can't, even, I can't get saved for everybody in Oklahoma. There's lots of people in Oklahoma, and we're not even that populated. There's lots of people in Oklahoma, aren't there? Texas doesn't count. It's not really a state, but uh, I mean, I can't get saved for anybody else. I can't. I can start on a personal level, and I can receive the Lord Jesus Christ. I can start right there, and and I can I can call on the Lord. I can say, Lord, I can't. I, I can't get saved for my my kid. I can't get saved for my spouse. I can't get saved for my mom and dad. I can't get saved for my third grade teacher. I can't get saved for this person or that person or this person. But Lord, I need I want to be forgiven of my sins. And on a personal level, you can get right with God. Yeah. I'm so thankful for that. That's the yeah. biggest deal. Yeah. Because then everybody can do that. 
Everybody can do that. I believe every person in the, in the city of Nineveh, or at least the majority, I don't know if it was everybody in the city of Nineveh, but I believe the majority of people in the city went personally to the God and, and asked for forgiveness of their sins. I believe they received it. I really do. There was repentance. You study the book of Jonah. Those people were turning to God. And they were turning from their sin. And they were, they were recognizing, wow, I'm a sinner. I need to be forgiven of my sins. There's your number 40 again. Didn't Jonah say in 40 days or in 40 nights the Lord's going to judge this city? There it is again. We're, we're in numerology. But on a personal level, you can get forgiven of your sin. But take a look at Luke chapter 18 for just a second. Luke chapter number 18. And verse number 13. Now this is the, the, uh, pr uh, the, the story Jesus is telling of the prayers of the Pharisee and the publican. I'm not going through the whole thing. But it says in verse number 13. And the publican, who is a sinner, they're just kind of a, they're a very visible sinner. People are aware they are sinners. It says, and the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote on, upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is his sinner's prayer. He is asking for mercy. He's asking for forgiveness on a personal level. Yeah. This is probably an Israelite. Uh, Israel's pretty sinful at this time. Um, he's probably living in a pretty sin sinful city. He's probably got a pretty sinful family. Who knows? Maybe he does. But on a personal level, he's praying and asking God for mercy. Amen? Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful for that. And, and look at the result. It tells us in verse number 14. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Justified. Right with God. That's a judicious term. It means not guilty. <coughs> Declared not guilty. So thankful for that. I'm so glad that we can meet the Lord on a personal level, aren't you? Yeah. No matter what America's doing, no matter what you know our, our city is doing, no matter what our family is doing, we can meet God on a personal level and get right with Him. Uh, notice he what he wasn't. Uh, there was some repentance here. There was some. Uh, he was standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven. Smote upon his breast. He's going. I am a sinner. I don't like that I'm a sinner. I don't like it. Jesus, please forgive me of those sins. That's what's going on in this man's, in this man's mind and heart. Remember, God's in control of all of this. Keep that in mind. Uh, judgment may come to America in my lifetime. Yeah. It really may. I'm just going to keep in mind, I'm going to try to keep in mind, God's in control of that. It came to Israel in Daniel's day. Yeah. Okay? If you know how Jeremiah ended up, how, how does Jeremiah end up, Brother Mark? Doesn't he end up, basically, okay, he preaches, he warns the people about Babylon coming, the people don't repent, they don't get right, they throw him in jail for the message. Uh, then when, they, when he finally gets set free from jail, he keeps preaching, the people still don't like his message, the Israelites basically enslave him and carry him down to Egypt where Jewish tradition has it, he was stoned to death. Now, what did he personally do to deserve all that? Hmm. Nothing. But he was in the midst of it. Judgment was coming on his nation at that time. Okay. Things, things are going to happen and, and, and God's in control. You, on an individual basis, have got to trust God. I've got to trust Him. We've been afraid of them tornadoes. If we're going to get hit by a tornado, we're going to get hit by a tornado. <laughs> Do you know the odds of being hit by a tornado? <laughs> but then there are sometimes I feel prompted, like there's something going on, like I feel prompted. Uh, get your family to shelter. I better listen to that voice too, you know. It's not, that's, it's not Jonathan's voice. Jonathan's panicking. There's a tornado coming. God wants that tornado to hit us. It's going to hit us. <laughs> Brother Dave Hardy has this wonderful story that he tells. Uh, he, he was, he had, I think he just took over Eastland Baptist Church uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and a tornado hit. 
and uh, he had just got him a new desk, like a really nice desk or something, and it hit their church building. He was in the church building when it was hitting, and he was underneath this desk, and he's holding onto this desk, and that tornado starts to pull the desk. He's like, no, it's not getting my desk. <laughs> he said, if the desk goes, I'm going to. And he wound up living through it. And he, you know, he gets out, everything's just leveled around him. And what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, if the Lord wants to protect you, He can protect you through anything. And, and if it's your time to go, it's your time to go. Right. We've just got to trust the Lord in those things. You know, Jehoshaphat was in battle. And, you know, he's dressed up like the king. And they're, he, and they're all aiming for the king. King Ahab's dressed in normal clothing. And the Bible says an archer just kind of shoots a, an arrow up in the air at a venture, it says. And the arrow hits Ahab. So, what I'm saying is the Lord's in control of this stuff. Yeah. Ultimately, you're not. And so, quit trying to control all of it. Uh, you're not. God's in control. Uh, number two, acknowledge your sins. Acknowledge your sins. Daniel said, we have sinned. Uh, this, this, this publican is, is, is saying, I'm a sinner. He's, he's confessing his sins. He says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm a sinner, he said. Acknowledge your sins. Don't just acknowledge them to the point where... There's, there's two ways of acknowledging sins. Number one, you can acknowledge sins and go, I'm a sinner. Too bad. I guess I'll just keep liking them. But there's also the acknowledgement of sin where you go, I'm a sinner. I don't like this about me. I need to be forgiven of this. I'm sorry I've sinned against the Lord. I'm sorry I've broken His commandments. I'm sorry that I, I trespassed against Him. I'm sorry about that. But then there's, you know, there's the type of, well, I'm, I'm just a sinner. Who cares? You know, it's no big deal. The Lord died for those. He gave His life. He went through the brutality of the cross for sin. It's not a, it's not a trivial, trivial thing. It's not a frivolous thing. Don't treat it frivolously. That's a slap in the face. I mean, can you imagine being Jesus, being beaten and spit upon and, and, and cursed and going through all that, and you just walk up and uh, you know, you're living in sin and, and just going, I'm sinning, what of it? It's kind of a slap in the face. Be careful with that. You don't want to do that. Don't want to do that to the Lord. It's not a good place to be. Acknowledge sins. Next, go to the one who is in control Amen. in prayer. You find Daniel praying, didn't you? You find this guy praying. You find Abraham interceding and praying for Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen, we need to pray for our nation. Amen. We need to pray for our world. For humanity. We need to pray for our cities. We need to pray for our families. Yeah. I, I pray for Idaho. I really do. I pray for Idaho. It's in trouble. It's in trouble. It's not the only one. We need to pray for our families. We need to pray for ourselves on a personal level. Next, we need to repent. We need to turn to the Lord. We need to turn to Him in our heart. We need to decide, you know what? I want to start following the Lord. I may slip up from time to time, but I want to follow the Lord. I want to, I want to get walking in His direction. Right. I want to quit walking in my direction. I want to quit walking in the direction of, the, of sin and where sin has taken me and where, where I've been going this, this whole time. I want to walk in the direction of the Lord. I want to pray and ask His forgiveness, and then I want to receive His forgiveness. I want to receive it. And next, let Him be Lord of your life after that. You say, well, Brother Joe, I've, I've prayed. I've asked for forgiveness of my sins before. I've, I've turned to him. That's good. Let him be Lord of your life now. With the rest of your time, let him be Lord of your life. Let him tell you what to do. Get in your Bible. Study it. Find out what he's, what he's wanting from you. Uh, find out uh, his blessings and find out what, what his promises for your life. Yeah. Find out the beautiful things that you've got that he's got in mind for you, what he's got in store for you. You say, why serve the Lord? Why? Why? First of all, for yourself. It's good for you. Uh, if you'll do what the Lord tells you, dear Christian, it's good for you. It's in your best interest on a personal level. Oh, it 
<laughs> it's in your best interest. Uh, I think it's in Deuteronomy where Mo Moses talks about the commandments the Lord has given, and he says they're not grievous, but they're, they're for our sake. Uh, okay, let me try this one. Daniel, thou shalt not kill. Don't murder anybody, okay? Say, why are you telling Daniel not to do that? It's in his best interest. It's in his best interest he doesn't do that. You say, well, if he never kills anybody, is that going to save him? No. No, he's saved by being forgiven of his sins, just like anybody else. But as a person who's forgiven of his sins, it's best to obey the Lord. You understand? Don't kill anybody. It might not work out too well for you. Yeah. Don't steal. Yeah. You say, well, why not? I mean, what, what is that? It's in his best interest. Yeah. On a personal level. Better if I don't steal. It's better if I don't lie. Mm -hmm. It's better if I don't commit adultery. Yeah. It's better if what are uh, uh, bear false witness. It's better, it's better if I don't cut it. It's in my best interest. It's better if I don't envy. I mean, those are just the ten. There's tons of them. Don't have any other gods before. Them. It's in your best interest. Right. That goes for all of us, right? Yeah. On a personal level. Do you know that'll bless your family? I really believe, I really believe, I've looked at my life, and I believe the Holy Spirit has pointed out I had a godly grandmother. He blessed her, and those blessings spilled over on me. I'm telling you, if you'll serve the Lord, dear Christian, it's not only in your best interest, but it's in the best interest of your family. You know those people you care about. Those people who... Really, you do love them. You do care about them. Some people try to convince themselves they don't. You say, why do people convince themselves they don't care about them? It's easier that way. They think it's going to be. It's easier that way if they feel like they're not ever going to care about that person. Oh, you do. And it's in your best interest. If you, if you live for the Lord, let Him have your life. It will bless your family. It will bless your family. Oh, it's so worth it. It's so, such an unselfish thing to do. It's sad that I have to tell you that, isn't it? Doesn't that show how selfish we are? It's in your family's best interest. I can't tell you how many things I wish I hadn't done. Why? Why, Brother Joe? Because I've met my kids. And one day, if the Lord tarries his coming, Lord willing, I might even meet some grandkids, and then I'm really going to feel bad about it. It's in, it's in your family's best interest. You say, well, I've, I've, you know, I've already missed the boat. No, you haven't. You can start right now. Yeah. You can start right now. Listen to the Lord and doing what He tells you to do. It'll bless your family. It'll bless your nation. If Lot and his family had been doing what they were supposed to be doing, it would have blessed their whole city. <coughs> oh, man. Can you imagine the guilt they lived with after Sodom and Gomorrah got burned off the face of the earth? And knowing they could have done something about it. Yeah, it can bless your whole city. It can bless your whole nation. It will bless all of humanity. Because then you start serving the Lord. You start listening to Him. He starts telling you to give to missions. You start you start supporting missionaries. He might even call you to the mission field, and all of a sudden you go and be a blessing. Some human beings you never even met. Some other country you don't even speak their language. And all of a sudden, because you started listening to the Lord, He's blessing humanity. Through you. Just like our sins affect so many different levels, so does our obedience to the Lord affect so many different levels. And I would encourage you, this morning, if you have not received personal forgiveness of your sins, there's no better morning to do it. Today is the day of salvation. You can do that today. If this morning you are saved, but you haven't been living for the Lord. You've been living selfishly. You've been living for yourself. I would encourage you, give your life to the Lord today. Rededicate your life today. It's in your best interest. It's in your family's best interest. It's in everybody's best interest. I'm going to ask everyone to stand. Every head bowed and every eye closed. And we have a hymn of invitation this morning.